So once again, thank you so much for joining us and welcome. Today we are going to cover what you need to know about applying to law school and how admissions work at Rutgers Law, as well as offerings and opportunities available here. Before jumping in, I want to introduce myself. My name is Amy Timko. I am an admissions officer at Rutgers Law School. And joining us today is Dean Anita Walton, Assistant Dean for Admissions at Rutgers Law School. We do ask that you hold your questions until the end of the presentation. And when you do enter questions, please enter them into the chat feature and not the Q&A feature. If we happen to not get to your question, please feel free to reach out to us via email and we can answer your question that way as well. So why should you apply to Rutgers Law? Because we know you want to attend law school in a great location with a robust academic experience and pursue a fulfilling career after having graduated with as little debt as possible. You will find this all here at Rutgers Law, as well as a few more things that we are extremely proud of. We are one law school with two locations in Newark and Camden that allow you to access three of the largest legal markets in the United States, New Jersey, New York, and Philadelphia. Our Newark location is located just 15 minutes from New York City. Within walking distance is the Essex County Courthouse and U.S. District Court of New Jersey, the Prudential Center, and many great restaurants. Rutgers Law in Newark gained the nickname the People's Electric Law School in the 1970s after a period of activism. Rutgers Law's Minority Student Program was founded in Newark in 1968 and continues to bring a wonderful cohort of students each year. The Minority Student Program, or MSP, is a post-admission program that serves full-time and part-time law students coming from underrepresented groups in the legal profession or disadvantaged socioeconomic backgrounds. After the merge of our law schools in 2015, MSP was brought to the Camden campus, and now students at both locations can benefit from paid summer internship opportunities, networking events with MSP alumni, study groups with upperclassmen, and extended orientation. If you'd like to be considered for MSP when you apply, on your application, you must indicate your interest in the program when it asks. You can also include a diversity statement to be considered. Across the bridge from Philadelphia is Camden's University District, featuring Camden County College, Rowan's Medical School, and the Rutgers Camden Campus. Within walking distance is the U.S. District Court of New Jersey, the New Jersey Superior Court, and the Camden Municipal Court while a five minute train ride will bring you into center city of Philadelphia. Just within the past few years, new apartments, office buildings, and a new park have been built around the waterfront in a, a period of revitalization. The Camden location has two exclusive programs, Social Justice Scholars and Summer Jumpstart. The Summer Jumpstart program requires no application and is open to all admitted Camden students. During Summer Jumpstart, you take one of your core law classes the summer before starting. Typically contracts, helping to ease the transition into law school by acclimating you to the rigors of a course while leaving you with one less class to worry about during the fall. Only one course can be taken in Jumpstart. The Social Justice Program allows students with a commitment to public service and social justice to earn a small scholarship, mentoring, summer funding, and more in exchange for completing pro bono hours. That application is made available to accepted Camden students in the spring, and each year a group of around 10 students are selected to be social justice scholars. While there are a few differences between our locations, there are many more similarities and things that keep us connected, like the holodeck. The holodeck allows students to take courses that are campus exclusive. So democracy and law, which is only offered in Newark, and comparative labor and employment law, which is only offered in Camden, can be made available to all students from the comfort of their home campus. Two identical holodeck classrooms exist in Newark and Camden, equipped with microphones and a camera that creates a live feed between the rooms. Each semester, a list of holodeck courses is released and students can petition to have a course offered in the holodeck. You also have access to law libraries at either location which serve the educational and research needs of law school students and faculty. Our students are provided with online research databases that help make legal research a bit easier. And in addition, our reference librarians are happy to help navigate the combined 1.2 million volumes. All of our reference librarians have graduated from law school themselves, so they know how to best address your unique legal research needs. To get a better understanding of life at Rutgers Law, we recommend reading the brief 
which is available on our website and contains blogs written by current law students. There you can read about student organizations, visiting the Supreme Court, networking opportunities through MSP, how there's no such thing as a typical law student, and so much more. Here at Rutgers Law, we offer a robust legal education with flexibility and practical training incorporated into everything we do. Students have the option to choose between our full-time and part-time programs to best accommodate their needs and schedules. Our traditional full-time Juris Doctor program takes three years to complete. Classes are typically taken place Monday through Friday between 9 a.m. and 5 p.m. Your first year schedule is made for you. Full-time students can work a maximum of 20 hours per week. The part-time evening program takes four to four and a half years to complete. Many students in the program, part-time program, work a nine to five job. So we are excited to announce that beginning in fall of 2021, our part-time evening program has transitioned to a hybrid format. Classes start at 6 p.m. and are typically three or four days per week. The hybrid model is structured so that you will be on campus mostly two nights a week for in-person instruction, and you will have remote instruction no more than two nights per week. Specific course times and schedules vary by campus and by year. Part-time students do not have a limit on the amount of hours they can work per week. At the Camden campus, we also offer a part-time day option. This typically applies for people with a full-time job with evening or irregular hours. The part-time day program will not have hybrid instruction. There are eight courses all law students are required to take their one-hour year. These include courses such as contracts, torts, civil procedure, criminal law, property, constitutional law, and legal research and writing. After the core courses are completed, you are able to create your own schedule with electives. A complete list of electives can be found on our website under the Academics tab. Whether you want to spend a semester living abroad or take a two-week deep dive into a specific topic with a travel study course, students can gain international insight and build global leadership skills. We have partnerships with Leiden University in the Netherlands and the University of Graz in Austria, where you can spend a whole semester studying outside of the US. A trip to Cuba is available through the Community and Transactional Lawyering Clinic, and visiting South Africa is a part of our South African Constitutional Law class. In addition to the robust legal curriculum you have access to here while at Rutgers Law, we also value the overlap between law and other academic disciplines. The law school is proudly embedded in Rutgers University, one of the nation's leading research institutions. Because of the rich university resources and our interdisciplinary focus, we are able to offer our students more than 11 dual degree options, including a JDMD, JDMBA, JDMSW, and several others. For all dual degree programs, you must apply and be admitted separately to each program. The law school will accept up to 12 credits from another program. Once you are a student, you will work with the registrars from both programs to create a plan of which courses will be accepted. This academic flexibility also applies to specialty areas offered here at Rutgers Law. We offer JD certificates in four programs that will allow you to customize your education and develop expertise in the practice area you are most interested in. Our current JD certificate programs include corporate and business law, family law, immigration law, and criminal law and procedure. If you choose to pursue a JD certificate, you will take courses, 15 credits or a variety of electives in this field and complete relevant externship or clinic work. We believe that hands-on practical training is just as important as traditional in-class academic learning. Therefore, we have many opportunities for students to gain real-world experience while in law school, including clinics, journals, externships, and moot court competitions. Rutgers Law School is a pioneer in clinical education and currently boasts 16 clinics across its two campuses in Newark and Camden, where student casework for actual clients is principally supervised by full-time Rutgers Law faculty. Some of the clinics offered include the Immigrants' Rights Clinic, Child Advocacy Clinic, Education and Health Law Clinic, the Federal Tax Law Clinic, and more. Students in the clinical education programs learn lawyering skills and development of professional identity while working with clients on numerous issues. 
and we are consistently ranked as one of the top clinical programs in the country in annual surveys. We also maintain a proud tradition of publishing influential legal scholarship in student-run law journals. In the weeks after 1L year, students can write onto journals at either location. Such journals include Law Review, Law and Public Policy, and the Women's Rights Law Reporter. As a journal member, you either write a note or comment for credit and experience to add on to your resume. Externships are open to students who have completed the first year of curriculum and would like to gain practical experience by working with attorneys or judges. Externships can help a student discover an interest in a particular, particular area of law. After completing an externship, a student may be able to get a letter of recommendation for future job prospects. Many legal employers think highly of externships and the valuable research and writing skills students develop. Externships are unpaid. However, a student can receive academic credit for those externships. On our website, you can find a list of locations where you can extern across New Jersey, New York, Pennsylvania, and Delaware. Finally, Rutgers Law students can enhance their advocacy skills by training and competing on teams against other law schools, regionally, nationally, and internationally, in mock trial, appellate moot court, mediation, and negotiation and arbitration competitions. Rutgers Law students have a strong record of success at these competitions because of their extensive preparation, excellent coaching, and trial and oral advocacy and mediation skills. Rutgers Law School is also committed to providing students with meaningful pro bono opportunities that is still an ethic of service, while providing much needed legal assistance to the broader community. Through the program, our students develop skills in professional responsibility, problem solving, and leadership, while also internalizing an ethic of service that is central to the legal profession. Our communities of Camden and Newark are the perfect cities in which to provide direct services and develop an appreciation for structural inequities. Students perform pro bono work in a variety of settings. Most of our projects are in-house partnerships with legal services providers focused on bankruptcy, disability rights, educational equity, Iraqi refugee assistance, prisoner reentry, and many other areas. In addition, students often gain approval to work with entities such as the Domestic Violence Unit of the Camden County Family Court and the ACLU. Excitingly, Rutgers Law has spearheaded the New Jersey Innocence Project, which is based out of the Camden campus. The breadth of Rutgers faculty experience, along with assistance from students, will allow the Innocence Project to offer an impressive array of services, including reviewing requests from prisoners, gathering and examining trial information and investigative records, dealing with forensic issues, assisting in reentry into the general population, and advocating for better practices and criminal justice reforms. Students can begin participating in some of our pro bono initiatives as early as one all year. And even if you don't intend to practice in the public interest sector upon graduation, our interactive pro bono programs offer you the invaluable opportunity to immediately start developing your legal knowledge and practice skills. Your Rutgers Law School academic experience will be guided by your exceptional faculty who are professors, mentors, scholars, and leaders. We have more than 120 faculty members, creating one of the finest, most diverse, and most intellectually wide-ranging communities of legal scholars and clinical professors in the nation. Our professors, professors are passionate about teaching in and out of the classroom, and they are accessible too. They will involve you in their research, amicus briefs, clinical projects, and wholeheartedly embrace the role of mentor. And we often hear from our students how amazed they are that our professors open door policies. Not only are our faculty members student driven, they are also influential and widely published scholars. They've written countless books, law review articles, textbooks, and they're quoted frequently in the news. They represent clients, file amicus briefs, and serve as counsel and impact litigation in addition to being consulted on legislation, law reform, and matters of public policy. And our impressive faculty roster doesn't end at current professors. We also have a rich legacy of past professors, such as former US Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. We just highlighted how at Rutgers Law, you'll receive intellectually demanding education and ample real world experience. But we don't stop there. 
Our Career Development Office provides you with every possible resource to combine your interest, experience, and skills into a successful career. Once you become a law student, you will be assigned an advisor and they will help you with finding internships, externships, and jobs. They also host skills training programs, panels, and workshops throughout the year on networking, resume, cover letter writing, and more. Career Development also hosts on-campus interviews in the fall semester for upperclassmen. This allows you the opportunity to interview with law firms and businesses for an externship or post-graduation job. In addition to the dedicated counselors in our Career Development Office, many administrators and staff members across the law school have earned a JD and have law practice experience, which they rely on to help you succeed. The Career Development Office is dedicated to helping you find meaningful employment. The majority of our students find employment in full-time JD required or JD Advantage jobs within 10 months of graduation. Our graduates find employment across a variety of sectors with employers through New Jersey, New York, Pennsylvania, and the United States. And no matter where in the United States you plan to practice, our alumni network will welcome you at your first job and support you on the way to your top job. Our 20,000 plus alumni work at every level. They are leaders at big law firms, solo practitioners in every field of law, high profile corporate legal counsel, influential members of the judiciary and legislators, and tireless advocates for the public interest. Some of our alum include Brian Quinn, who is the director of US Public Policy at Audible, the world's largest seller and producer of audiobooks. Before Elizabeth Warren became a US Senator from Massachusetts, and Democratic presidential contender, she spent her formative law school years at Rutgers Law. Rebecca Bresnik is currently the lead attorney for NASA's International Space Station, and Fabiana Pierre-Louis has been confirmed by Governor Phil Murphy for a seat on the New Jersey Supreme Court, becoming the first Black woman to sit on the court. To highlight fantastic stories such as Rebecca Bresnik's journey into space law with NASA, the law school launched a new podcast series called The Power of Attorney which features our codings in conversation with leading legal minds, including alumni of our law school, our professors, and others. The series gives listeners an inside look at the power of a legal education and explores what it means to be a lawyer in an ever-changing world. You can find it on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and more. So if you're interested, be sure to look it up. At Rutgers Law, we do our best to make a high quality education as affordable as possible. Here is the cost of tuition and fees for this year. The amount shown for full-time students is per year, not per semester. Part-time students are billed per credit rather than per semester, and a total of 90 credits is required to graduate. If you are out of state and considering moving to New Jersey to attend Rutgers Law, you should be happy here that you can easily establish in-state residency and start paying in-state tuition in your first semester by providing our office with a few required documents like a New Jersey lease and license. When you apply to Rutgers Law, you are automatically considered for scholarships. We offer many partial and full-time scholarships, and in fact, the majority of our students each year receive a scholarship. We also collect scholarship opportunities from law firms, bar associations, and other organizations for our current students to apply to. Most students finance law school through a combination of scholarship and financial aid which is the other big area of financial support that can help you with tuition and cost. To apply for most types of aid, including loans, you are required to submit the free application for federal student aid. Depending on your circumstances, there are different types of loans and financial aid opportunities available to you. For more information on that, you can visit our website at financialaid.ruckers.edu. We have directors of financial aid at each campus who are part of the admissions team. This means you don't have to go searching across main campus for help, and you can get advice specifically from a law school financial aid expert rather than someone split across several academic programs. Now that we have covered key offerings of our JD program and how to finance your legal education, let's take a look at the application process. All law school applications in the country go through the Law School Admissions Council, or LSAC. The first thing you need to do in the application process is visit their website and create an account. All required documents needed to apply to Rutgers Law 
must be submitted through LSAC. Here are the documents you will need to submit when you apply. You must submit tr transcripts from every undergraduate and graduate institution you were enrolled in. This includes any school, like a community college or for foreign institution as part of studying abroad. Letters of recommendations can come from professors, supervisors, or whoever you believe will write the best letter for you. If you're coming right from undergrad or recently graduated, you may want to contact a professor who you know well. If you have been in the workforce for several years, you can ask supervisors or colleagues. For the personal statement, there is no set topic. However, many successful essays include an applicant's reason for why they want to attend law school and what they would like to do with their degree, if they know already. You should aim for around a thousand words, including why Rutgers Law specifically is also nice, but not required. Your resume should highlight your work experience especially anything related to the legal field. A one to two page resume is ideal, but for those who have extensive work experience, it can certainly be longer. Another important thing to note is on the application for Rutgers Law, you are asked to select your campus preference, Camden, Newark, or no preference. Your campus preference determines where you are assigned after being accepted. So if you know which campus you'd like to attend, be sure to select that option on that question. Wherever you begin classes for your first year, you must remain for your first year. After that, you have the freedom to switch between campuses for a semester, year, or the rest of your legal education. A 157 or above on the LSAT and a 3.39 or above undergraduate GPA are considered competitive scores. It is important to keep in mind that these are not minimum scores needed to apply. Our review process is holistic, meaning that all aspects of your application are taken into consideration when making a decision. Also, we do not average LSAT scores, so your highest score carries the most weight. Here you can see all upcoming LSATs announced so far. Three months of preparation is recommended, to be sure to so be sure to factor that in when you're choosing a test date. The LSAT flex is not viewed differently than the standard LSAT exam. We often get questions about the best method of preparation for the LSAT, and the answer is, it depends on how you learn. Some people know that they need more guidance and deadlines, so an online course may be right for them. Others will self-study with prep books. There are some of the LSAT prep companies that our work-study students have used and recommended in the past. I typically say to start with Khan Academy as they offer free prep in partnership with LSAC. Last, but certainly not least, are important deadlines. Our application is now open, our priority deadline is March 15th, and our final deadline is May 15th. Submitting an application earlier in the cycle is usually better as earning a seat in the class can be less competitive and scholarship funds can get limited closer to the final deadline. That being said, it's most important to make sure you're confident in your application and documents rather than meeting the March deadline. One final bit about the application process is that we have rolling admissions. The admissions committees begin reviewing files in October, and it can take between six to eight weeks, sometimes shorter, sometimes longer, from the date your file was made complete to receive a decision. Follow us on all these places to stay in touch and find out what new things are going on at Rutgers Law. Here we have our contact information and the email address, so that way if you have any questions or concerns, please feel free to reach out via email and we'll get back to you as soon as possible. And at this point, uh, we would like to open up the chat for any questions that you may have that hopefully we can answer for you. Thank you, Amy. I'm gonna jump in for a minute and just say welcome everyone. I'm Anita Walton, I'm the Assistant Dean for Admissions. I'm located on the Newark campus. Amy is on the Camden campus. You can either uh, throw questions in the chat and we'll get to them one at a time um, and answer them here. Um, or if you want to chat with us privately, you can do that as well. Thank you for that presentation, Amy. Of course, and thank you everyone for joining us. As um, we mentioned, this, okay. this is being recorded and will be available on our website. We'll send you out the link in a day or so. It takes a little bit of time before um, the recording gets uploaded. 
Is there an age cutoff for the MSP? Absolutely not. We don't have an age cutoff for MSP. Um, so no matter what age you are applying, uh, if you're interested in the, in, in the minority student program, absolutely apply. Uh, which campus will law students attend or does it depend on the location you put on your application? So it's entirely up to you. Um, when you are applying, you can select which campus you have a preference for. So if you know you wanna go to the New York campus or you know you wanna go to the Camden campus, go ahead and select them. Um, otherwise, you can put no preference. If you select no preference, we do assign a campus to you. Earlier on, if you apply and you are assigned a campus and you choose to switch campuses, you're most likely going to be able to switch. However, as we, as our class fills up and we get closer to um, closing our applications and closer to the semester starting, you may not be able to switch your, your campus at that point. There was a question about total enrollment and um, how many are usually admitted. Last year, our applicant pool was about 3,600 applications. Um, and this year we're running ahead of schedule, <laughs> ahead of, of where we were last year. So it's hard to say where we're gonna end up at the end of the year. Um, we have a total enrollment on the first year was 474 students. There was about 200 of them were in Camden and the rest were in Newark. We do have day and evening programs. So some of those were split into the evening program. Um, they, you will stay at your home campus for your entire first year. So you're not going to be going back and forth between the two. Um, but after that, if you want to spend a semester in Camden, you could just go ahead and do that. If you want to, if you're a Newark student, if you're a Camden student and want to spend a semester in Newark, you can do that. Um, you would not be taking a class, uh, one class in Camden and three classes in Newark because of the distance between the two um, campuses. We do, as Amy mentioned, we do have a special classroom that connects the two campuses, and now a lot of things can be done. Uh, faculty are now used to using Zoom or WebEx, as we're using today, or Canvas. Um, there's a question about, um, Amy, I'll let you take a question about Jumpstart, but first I'll answer the question about switching from full-time to part-time after your first year. The answer to that is yes, you can do that. Um, you have to stick it out for the first two semesters, part-time, and then with that third semester in the fall, you can speak to uh, the academic dean at either location about switching to full-time. Part-time students take 10 and a half credits per semester in general. It's a little different in Camden than in Newark, but that's that's a, that's a the average. Um, part-time is up to 11 credits, no fewer than eight, up to 11, 12 credits or more is considered full-time. Amy, you wanna answer the question about summer jumpstart? Sure, let me Did you see up. that one? I did see it, but unfortunately the chat's going so fast. I like was, okay, so we have two. Is there a separate application for Summer Jumpstart? Um, no, so just keep in, bear in mind that Summer Jumpstart is specific to the Camden campus. So you would need to be attending the Camden campus for your first year. Once you are accepted, uh, you submit your seat deposit, um, usually kind of like early summer, like maybe you kind of get it like May, June, you'll be getting an email, actually, yeah, probably more May. Um, you'll be getting an email from us saying, um, you know, here's the information on the Summer Jumpstart program. Are you interested in being part of that program? And that's when you would fill out that form and say yes. And then you would pick. We typically offer a morning class and an evening class to accommodate um, schedules. So you would pick which which class section you want it to be in. Um, which also leads us into yes, Summer Jumpstart is available for part time students. Once again, for our Camden students, uh, actually, if you are a part time student, you're you're in the Summer Jumpstart program because you would be taking contracts in the summer. So it's your choice if you want to take contracts this summer coming into your 1L year as a part-time student, or if you want to take contracts on the back end of your um, 1L year. And then, of course, there are opportunities to take summer um, courses for any student, whether you're part-time or full-time. We do offer summer courses, um, and students will do that to take a lesser course load during you know, your regular semesters, or if you're trying to graduate like a semester early, this way they can knock out some classes in the summer. Uh, there's a question about career development and how they uh, work with students for summer internships for 1L and 2L students. Um, what happens with career development is that they will be in touch with you as a 1L student, usually in the end of October, early November. They will set up programs for 1L, so they will start working with you really very early in the time that you um, are starting at the law school. They don't want to bother you for about the first eight weeks because you need to concentrate on school, um, but they will start working with you right then and there. You get assigned, at least here in Newark, you're assigned to a counselor. Um, 
you are able to uh, talk to them about your resume, cover letter, what kinds of law you think you'd like to do, and then they will work with you on summer internships. There's lots and lots of stuff available. Um, New Jersey has a very large judiciary. Many of the of the judges hire summer clerks. So yes, they will work with you and help to um, secure those summer internships. Um, I think our career development office works way over time to make sure that every student has the attention that they need and deserve uh, to help them figure out their career path. It's not easy uh, for lawyers, and we want to make sure that you have as much help as possible. There is another question about whether there are safe spaces on campus for students, uh, such as meditation rooms or relaxation rooms. Um, there is in Newark, there is a room that is dedicated to a if a student needs some quiet space, and there's also small study rooms where you can um, go into that study room and you can have some quiet time in those study rooms. I'm sure the same exists in Camden. Yes, we have space for our students and um, our Dean of Students also wants wonderful programs, usually particularly around like midterms and finals where we actually even will have therapy dogs come in onto the bridge uh, and students can spend some time with therapy dogs to just even help like lower anxiety as far as, as that time goes in the semester. Um, and I'm just going to follow up on the uh, clerkships a little bit because I, I mentioned clerking in the summer. Someone asked if we have uh, clerkships across the United States. After graduation, um, students will go to other parts of the country. You're not uh, you're not stuck only here in the tri-state area, not by any means. But it depends on geographically where you want to live and where you want to practice. Um, but yes, students do go to other parts of the country to clerk. Um, but again, the New Jersey judiciary is very large and takes a lot of clerks. They turn over every year. So there you'll find competition from schools outside of New Jersey trying to, uh, to clerk for New Jersey judges and courts. But yes, they do go all over the country. If you really want to go someplace else like California, um, Chicago, um, uh, down to Florida, you should definitely talk to the career development people early on so that they can help you figure out what's the best way to do that. And another question about the priority deadline. We don't really know how many seats are open until we start getting seat deposits. And the first round of seat deposits um, comes in, in on April 15th. And then as we continue to admit students later on in the cycle, that deadline moves a little bit later. So it moves to May 1st and then to May 15th. Usually by about the middle of May, we have a pretty good sense as to um, how full the class is. So things can start getting tighter. Um, they certainly did last year where we actually had to stop admitting students at one point um, because we had a lot of seat deposits and we didn't have the summer melt as we call it that we normally would have. But um, it helps if you can get your application in earlier rather than later and see where it takes you. Uh, wait, I had a question. Can you submit your application without your LSAT or with your LSAT score pending? Yes, you can submit your application. You can have all your other documents ready to go. Um, and then we would just be waiting for your LSAT score. We will not read your application. It will not be considered complete until we have your LSAT score though. So just know that we will not read your application until we have your score in. But you can submit all of your documents ahead of time so that way you know it's in and ready to go for when you have your score. Um, how soon do you have to establish residency in New Jersey to qualify for in-state? Must you do that prior to your application? No, you don't have to do it prior to your application. You know, on your application, put your address wherever that you're living. Um, usually our students, if they're transferring from out of state to in state within that first semester is where we're asking our students to provide the lease and switch over your, to your New Jersey license. Um, and we are aware that in the past year, year and a half, it has taken slightly longer to get your license switched over because you have to, it's like by appointment only at the DMV. Um, so some of our students, you know, haven't been able to get their license until like December 1st. So I just got a bunch of licenses for December 1st, uh, but you'll be considered uh, in state resident from your first semester if you are able to provide those documents to us, but you don't have to do it prior to submitting your application. Does each campus have the same courses? Are there any courses only offered at one or the other campus? So your first year are required. You have eight core courses that are required. So those are offered on both campuses. Um, after that, when you're in your upper level courses, a lot of the courses are offered on both campuses on um, just different professors teaching. There are some that are only offered on the Newark or only offered on the Camden campus. That's when we try to utilize the holodeck because that means that a professor could be in Newark teaching, but it's also being live streamed to a classroom on the Camden campus or vice versa. You also have the opportunity when you become an upperclassman that if there is a particular course that you really want to take in Newark or Camden, or if you want to spend a whole semester on an opposite campus, you can go ahead and do that.
When you post a question in the chat, if you could post it to everyone, that would be really helpful. Can you apply to the dual JD MBA program after starting 1L if accepted into the law school? So that's typically the time frame that works for our students. So they'll be in the law school, they'll be a 1L student, and during their 1L year, they're applying based on the timeline for the MBA program. They'll apply, they'll get admitted to the MBA program. They'll know that, you know, within their 1L year, and then they'll start taking courses in the business school um, in their second year. Um, I mean, the, do, or do, you want, do you have students that usually do the opposite where they, where they do the business school first? It's usually law um, school first, right? We don't, you know, the business school is right up the street from us. And um, they, I would say we probably have maybe 10 to 12 students that are pursuing the joint JD MBA. Um, many of them will apply for the MBA program while they're a 1L student and not before, but take the GRE or GMAT beforehand because they do require either one of those and you want that off the table before you start applying for the MBA program. Um, I've had some students apply to both programs at the same time. I will say the, the law school and um, the MBA program, and then they tend to put the MBA program on hold, come to the law school first, and then go back to do the MBA program for their second year, and then a combination of the two during their third and fourth year. Um, there was a question about students finding housing. We do have two residence halls on campus. Um, our residence hall here in, in Newark is being renamed today, the Ruth Bader Ginsburg Residence Hall. And uh, there's 330 Cooper on the Camden campus. Um, you get individual rooms within suites. They do uh, put law students together within those rooms if they can. Um, sometimes there is an open space and, and they will put an MBA student in there, but that's for for Newark, it's all graduate students only. Beyond that, um, oftentimes one of you will set up a Facebook page um, after seat deposits are in and um, make connections in that way. We will have a Facebook page for your class that we will set up. We just have not set the whole thing up yet because um, we lost our administrator <laughs> who went to another went to another job. So we've got to re reconfigure that. Um, but there will be ways for you to connect on social media. Uh, without too much difficulty. Uh, another question about reviewing the application, is the GPA or LSAT weighed the same or differently? I would say as I'm reading files and Amy's a file reader also, I look at them in tandem. I can't really um, look at one separately and the other separately because they tell us two very different numerical things about you. One is your ability to, um, to uh, on the LSAT, to think analytically, to think logically, to perform, uh, with a multiple choice question under a time frame, and you're competing obviously with everyone nationwide. The other, your GPA shows us your coursework over four years. Um, we oftentimes see that that freshman year is not the best year, but things get better. After that, we can see the difficulty of the of the uh, major that you may have chosen, um, the kind of work that you did, if you've done research with a professor. So those two pieces are both numerical indicators of your ability to perform on the law school level, but they're telling us different parts of that numerical equation. So we do have to look at them in tandem. Uh, we have a question about MSP applicants uh, in relation to statistics. Are they judged the same as non MSP applicants? In other words, do MSP applicants have the same 157 median? So our minority student program is actually a post admissions program. So when we're admitting students, we're not specifically looking if you want to be part of the minority student program or not. Um, so we're not um, we're not evaluating our MSP applicants on any other different type of um, LSAT median. Dean Walton, if you want to touch on that anymore, or if that's no, I think I think that's fine. <laughs> um, another question about whether we can help you with your personal statements. The answer is no, because we are reading your personal statement. So it would be a conflict of interest for us to help you with your personal statement. If you are currently a, um, a student at a college campus, go to your writing center, find your pre-law advisor. If you're not, um, give your essay to someone that you trust and let them read it and give it back to you um, with comments about, you know, help, helping you with sentence structure, if need be, organization, et cetera. But um, we do not review personal essays before they're submitted. Uh, you have to have that ready to go and um, put with your application so that when we see it, it's the first time that we see it. Um, there's another question about sections and how first year students get assigned to sections. 
Um, I can tell you about what happens here in Newark and maybe Amy can talk about in Camden. I do the section assignments here in Newark. And what we do last year, we had about 40 students per section. So I have to balance that out with um, uh, all kinds of different criteria, um, you know, men, women, ages, colleges. I don't want everyone from Rutgers undergrad to end up in the same section. Um, I spread out the MSP students across all the sections. Um, so it's, it's not really random. Um, it's with a lot of thoughtfulness about how we're composing each section. Uh, so that the faculty have a whole variety of, of students and a lot of diversity within that section um, when they're teaching the class. So it it takes me it takes me quite a while to do that, and I want to make sure that I'm trying to put together like if I have a few students who are let's say in their late 30s or early 40s, I want to make sure that they're going to see somebody like themselves in that classroom. So Amy, can you talk a little bit about what happens in Camden? I would say it's very similar, except on the Camden campus, we, our registrar does the assignment of the classes. Um, and sometimes like, you know, like our tours class might be a larger section um, that year. So you might have, you know, 60 students in that, but then your contracts class might only have 30 students. So you're not going to have all of the same students every time in every class. Um, but as far as the assignment of the sections go, um, yeah, there's a lot that goes into it. It's not just like, you know, click a button random and the computer assigns students to sections. Amy, there's a question about moot court and mock trial and the difference. Can you answer that one? I don't know if I'm going to be able to do like a fantastic job. So I know like our Hunter moot court competition is something that's like an internal Rutgers thing. And a lot of like our mock trial are more um, kind of like uh, regionally, you're competing against other schools, you're competing internationally. So the way I see it, like in like the courses that we look at is that our moot court competition is kind of more of the internal Rutgers. You're against other Rutgers students and your mock trials tend to be more of the regional and international ones. Um, I'm not sure what the Lex fellowship is, so I'm, I'm not say, either, unfortunately. Yeah, so I'm going to say no, because if we don't know what it is, then we probably do not participate. But if you want to send one of us an email, we'll try to find the answer to that question. Um, all students who are admitted are automatically considered for scholarships, and there is not a separate application that you have to do. Um, so after we decide to admit you, your application goes back to the admissions committee, and then we start to assign scholarships. They have a very complicated matrix for assigning scholarships, and we're well aware that our tuition is very reasonable to start with, but we want to do the best that we can to make it affordable for students to come here. And if you have a master's degree, we absolutely evaluate that GPA. Um, so when we get like a cumulative GPA that's specific that LSAC kind of generates for us, if you're at multiple undergrad institutions, um, that's specifically your undergrad GPA, but then we also have to have your transcript for your master's degree. So we look at that and a lot of times we'll see, you know, you may not have have had the best performance as an undergrad student, but then you continue to on to a grad degree program a professional school and your GPA is higher there. And we take that into account because we can see that you've been in a demanding program and that you can excel in that program. Uh, and there's another question about undergraduate degrees that have written evaluations like, um, I'm going to say Reed College, I think, does that. Um, there's a few. And I, you know, I look through all of those evaluations and try to pull out um, as quickly as I can what the professors are saying about you. And usually, you know, some professors are very, uh, very wordy and tell us a lot about how you did during that semester. Others are a little bit, sh a little bit shorter, but yeah, they get read. Um, and we do, you know, we can see they usually vote whether you, you're like a high pass or a medium pass or a low pass. So we do take all of that, all of their uh, notes into consideration. I think those are probably some of the more interesting um, GPAs that we get to read. I mean, I, when I'm looking at a transcript, I can tell if you're taking a lot of, of, you know, 101 or 201 courses to boost up your GPA. Um, but these kinds of, of evaluations give us a lot more meat to what that course was all about and also how well you did. Uh, we have a student asking if we would consider the Camden campus more business oriented because they have heard that the newer campus is more social justice oriented. Both of our campuses are social justice oriented and we have a fantastic business program. So I don't personally think that one is more oriented towards business and one is more oriented towards social justice. I think it's a wonderful um, it's a wonderful um, kind of thing, balance of the two. Um, do you all undo, what are your opinions? Yeah, I, when we talk about social justice, um, I think we, we're trying to educate um, 
new lawyers that are going to have a sense of their place in the world and the sense of community and the power that their uh, law degree will bring them. Um, it doesn't matter if you decide that you want to go work in the corporate world, if you want to work um, you know, in, in government, if you decide you want to be a prosecutor, um, how you give back to your community and how you uh, mindfully work in a way that you are um, uh, aware of social justice issues that you're dealing with. It could be that you're dealing with a limit, uh, tenant landlord problem or dealing with a municipal, municipal um, uh, zoning issue. Um, just being mindful that how this impacts um, people all across the board and not just your client, but other people as well. Um, I think that has been the goal of our faculty, both here in Newark and in Camden, as we educate you and then send you out into the real world to do real good things. Um, so it's, uh, you know, you can certainly do a corporate, do corporate work once you graduate from either Newark or Camden. And you may find yourself doing pro bono work in that big law firm that you're working at that deals with prisoners issues at Rikers Island. I've had um, alumni who have done that or have worked with um, with refugees in different um, immigration issues. So it's how you decide to give back to society. That will be your decision how you want to give back. But I think we we feel very strongly that um, when students graduate from here, that they understand that there are lots of people in the world who need uh, legal representation and that social justice is very important um, to to have uh, you know a sense of as to what that means and what that means for them. The question that um, people with you know eight plus years or more work experience are they still a good fit for the full time program? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, a lot of times what, when you're choosing to do full time or a part time program, a lot of times it's like a financial decision for students. You know, students want you know need to continue to work to generate income or. They're you know, already working as a paralegal and they absolutely want to keep those connections, you know, so they're going to do part time. But just because you have, you know, a decent amount of work experience doesn't mean that you wouldn't be a good fit for the full time program. If you're able to take advantage of the full time program and graduate a year or a year and a half faster, you know, absolutely do that. Um, I had a question about transferring schools as an undergrad. Um, and, you know, their GPA at the previous school was higher than their GPA now, but they, because they've only had one, one semester. We look at all of your transcripts from all of your undergrad institutions. Um, and when LSAC generates your cumulative GPA, we can also see the breakdown per academic year. So, you know, we can see if you, you know, if you had a bumpy start and your GPA has gone, GPA has gone up, or if you had a really strong start and your GPA has gone down for some reason. Um, GPA going up is a good thing to see. GPA going down, not as good of a thing to see. So I will say that if your GPA for some reason takes a dip for a semester or an academic year, sometimes it's helpful to write in um, your addendum, just kind of explaining maybe, you know, if there were circumstances in that year that um, affected your, your GPA. Because and just a quick read holistically. So we want to know, you know, what's going on. Just a quick um, uh, comment about the pictures that you see down below. The first two on the left are both the Camden campus and the other two on the right with the spiral staircase and the library. Those are the Newark campus. We will um, hopefully by January <laughs> have virtual tours that will be posted up on our website. So you'll be able to uh, click on a short like 5 minute tour of not only the law school, but also the surrounding area. So those are in production right now. Yes, because unfortunately at this time, our campus campuses are still closed to visitors. So it's only our students and faculty and staff being allowed in the building, you know, just a safety precaution. Uh, I have not gotten any word and I don't know that Dean Walton has either as to when we'll be conducting in person, but at least there will be a virtual component to it that might make it a little bit easier, especially when, you know, we are one law school, but there are two campuses and you might not be sure what location you want. At least you'll be able to virtually see the difference. Amy, did you have photos of the Camden Library during the presentation? I don't remember. There must have been. Yes, I think there. I think in our library PowerPoint. <laughs> Let's go back. Sorry for like the quick flash in here. That's a courtroom. There we go. Um, that one's Newark. That one's Newark. Yeah, we might not actually. They're very similar though. Um, I know the student on the bottom left is actually, I graduated with him from Camden Law School. So I would imagine that's part of the, <laughs> the Camden, but I don't know that's particularly in the library. That might actually be a study room um, or it's actually a study room within the library. But um, it is set up, you know, kind of like you see in the top picture, you know, we have like the long tables, you can sit, you can study. 
and then on like the second and third floor in the Camden campus, it's, you know, tons of stacks of books that you'd be used to. And then like smaller little study desk table, like nooks that you can kind of study uh, alone and, and have quiet if you need it. Uh, this fall classes were taught in person, um, both on both campuses. Um, all students, faculty and staff have to show proof of being vaccinated, uh, fully vaccinated against COVID-19. And there was ways that those that your vaccination card had to be uploaded to um, uh, to the university system. You can ask for an exemption, but they were very stingy about giving out exemptions to the vaccine. Uh, everyone in the building in public spaces and in classrooms had to be masks. And um, if they were eating or drinking in the public spaces, they could pull their masks down, but it's expected that the masks should go back up as soon as they're finished uh, eating or drinking. There was no no food or drink inside the classrooms. Uh, the classrooms on the newer campus, and I think on Camden as well, um, had uh, new microphone systems installed so that students could hear better. Uh, things were amplified in the classroom because, as you know, talking through a mask, sometimes uh, words get jumbled. So they did have um, uh, new uh, microphones placed in the ceiling in all of the big classrooms um, on the first floor. So, yes, we were back in person, but um, we did not allow visitors to come in um, and we have not scheduled anything in person for this for the spring as of yet, because they have not lifted that ban yet. How often do we review applications on a rolling basis? Um, we had a student apply November 30th. So typically it'll take six to eight weeks for your decision once your file is marked complete. So we have to go through everything. Dean Walton does this actually and make sure everything is in there, that you're not missing any letters of recommendation, that we have um, an LSAT score, um, resume, all that kind of stuff has to be in. Once you are marked complete, it is then put into a queue for readers to read. And from that point, you're looking at about six to eight weeks for a decision. There was a question about if they go to Camden and they want to come to Newark for the international justice program or something else, maybe a clinic that's being offered in Newark, you can still register and apply for those programs. But I would suggest that you spend your semester in Newark because it's 90 miles between the two campuses and traveling back and forth um, will be exhausting <laughs> to say the least. And oftentimes, if you're in a clinic, you're expected that you're going to put in anywhere from 15 to 20 hours a week in the clinic because the clinics are very uh, credit heavy. You get a lot of credits for it and you're working um, immediately with, you know, with clients or working on a big case and working with professors directly on a huge brief. So you're expected to put in quite an, a, a lot of, of hours on the clinic. So if you think you want to do something like that for semester, the beauty of having the two locations is you can just come to Newark, just register for the courses, although you probably would want to live in this area uh, in order to do that. I agree with that as well. Um, and, you know, having done clinic programs as a law school student, um, you know, when you're put on the docket isn't entirely up to you uh, when you're appearing in court as well. So, like, I remember having to get, like, a special passes from professors or excuses to, like, miss half of family law and then, like, come in running from the second half from, from court. Um, so, it would be easier to take all of your classes when you're in an intense clinic program or something like that, like, to be on that campus for, for that semester. Uh, if we have someone that's been in the workforce for several years, um, should they still include awards like undergrad awards on the resume? Um, yeah, I mean, if it, if it was a distinguished award, a distinguished fellowship, um, an award that you're really proud of, that might speak to something that has to do with applying to law school. Absolutely. Because, I mean, that could be like one tiny line under your undergrad. Um, so I wouldn't say um, I wouldn't say you have to exclude it because you've been you've been out of undergrad for several years. In your 1L year, we do all the choosing for you. So you will be given a schedule and told here, we'll see you at the end of a year. <laughs> go to class when we tell you to go to class. So yes, basically your courses are all picked out for you and your schedule will be a set schedule. Um, and it's you'll know that's Monday through Friday because it's expected that you're treating it like a full-time job. Right, right. Um, in Newark, basically classes start at 9.30 in the morning and end at 3.45 in the afternoon with some nice breaks in the middle. Camden is about the same. Um, there are some days that will be more class heavy. For example, Mondays and Fridays tend to be a little bit lighter. Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday tends to have more classes. Um, after the first year, you have a little more control over your schedule. You can pick and choose the classes that you want. There are some requirements that have to be fulfilled. There's a, a upper level writing requirement. There's a skills requirement. You have to take professional responsibility, but there's lots of assistance. We have um, lots of deans and faculty who do 
uh, academic support who can help guide you in terms of what upper level courses you should take and when you should take them. For example, you wouldn't want to take um, some of the big four credit classes all in one semester, like evidence, uh, business associations, uh, criminal procedure here is four credits. That would be that's not a smart thing to do. You should spread those out over um, maybe two or three semesters because it's just you're you're putting a lot of weight on your grades for those uh, big four credit classes. And there are a lot of work in for one semester. And our register is really helpful with that too. So if you have questions, um, you know, I know I have gone when I was a student, I'd go to um, the, our dean and, and talk about like, well, you know, these are the courses I wanted to take, and and it might be a conversation of, well, this, this is really this is a really heavy course load. Maybe we can spread, you know, this class to next semester. Um, so you do have help in making in making your class schedule if you want it or if you want like opinion and advice about it. Do full time day students have to take any night classes? No. You absolutely do not have to take a single night class as a full time um, day student um, to graduate within the 4 years. That being said, you can take night classes if you want to. Uh, there were several night classes I took, particularly because I wanted a, um, a specific professor and I very much enjoyed my night classes, but it's not something that is required of our, our full time students. I think we have time for like 1 or 2 more questions. We miss any. Okay, I think if there's no more questions, then I think we're we're done. Do you see any more questions, Amy? I don't, chat? but I will say if we happen to what I'm gonna do is I'll put my email uh, in the chat as well. So if we happen to miss, because sometimes it's hard as like questions are coming in, we might miss a question or two. So if there's um, a question that you have or something that's very specific to you and you don't want to ask it here, I'm gonna go ahead and put my email address and please uh, reach out and we would be happy to uh, get some answers to you. I'm doing the same for us as well. Um, oh, one more. Let's see. Will there still be financial aid available for students applying late in the cycle, not taking their LSAT until January? So, two different types of financial aid. Um, when you're applying for federal loans and things like that, right? So you can you can make that application at any time and apply for those. So those will be available to you. If you're talking specifically scholarships that are considered when you apply, the later you apply, the less scholarship monies are available to offer. Um, but I think taking your LSAT in January, you're still in a really good position because you should absolutely have be able to have your application in by the March 15th deadline, which is like a really good deadline to, to put on yourself as far as wanting to apply um, and, and see you know, scholarship offers. I put my email in the in the chat. Also, our general admissions email is also in the chat. Um, so please reach out to us if there are if you need more clarification or if other questions come up that we haven't been able to get to or didn't answer. Yes, thank you for joining us today, and thank you for all of your wonderful questions. Good luck with your applications. Really, good luck. Yes, we look forward to reading them.